Are we live? I think we are live. Why, hello, everybody. It's Aaron once again, back for another installment of Treasure Island here on your library live, streaming live from the White Mountain Library, where everything is awesome because that's how we roll. Now, you may remember that when we last left off, ah, we were just boarding the Hispaniola and we had seen that rascal black dog at Long John Silver's Tavern. Hmm. Whoa. So, let's dive right back into the story. <clears throat> chapter, uh, chapter 9. Powder and Arms. The Hispaniola lay some way out, and we went under the figureheads and round the sterns of many other ships, and their cables sometimes grated underneath our keel, and sometimes swung above us. At last, however, we got alongside, and we were met and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow, a brown old sailor, with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly, but I soon observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man, who seemed angry with everything on board, and was soon to tell us why, for we had hardly got down into the cabin when a sailor followed us. Captain Smollett, sir, Axon to speak with you, he says. <sighs> I'm here always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope, all ship shape and sea worthy. Well, sir, said the captain, better speak plain. I believe, even at the risk of offense. I don't like this cruise, I don't like the men, and I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet. Perhaps, sir, uh, you don't like the ship, inquired the squire, very angry as I could see. I can't speak as to that, sir, not having seen her tried, said the captain. She seems a clever craft. More than that, I can't say. Possibly, sir, you may not like your employer either, says the squire. But here Dr. Livesey cut in. Stay a bit, said he, stay a bit. No use of such questions as that but to produce ill feeling. The captain has said too much, or he has said too little. But I'm bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You say you, you don't, you say, like this cruise. Now why? I was engaged, sir, on what we call sealed orders, to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me said the captain. So far, so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair now, do you? No, said Dr. Livesey. I don't. Next, said the captain, I learn we are going after treasure. Hear it from my own hands, mind you. Now, treasure is a ticklish word. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them above all when they are secret, and when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret has been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot? asked the squire. It's a way of speaking, said the captain. Blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you are about, but I'll tell you my way of it. Life or death and a close run. That is all clear, and I dare say true enough, replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe us. Next, you say you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smollett, and I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands if you go to that. Perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should perhaps have taken you along with him, but the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself, shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. Do you mean he drinks? cried the squire. No, sir, replied the captain, only that he's too familiar. <sighs> well, now, and the short and long of it, captain, asked the doctor, tell us what you want. Well, gentlemen, are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. 
Then as you've heard me very patiently, saying things that I could not prove, hear me a few words more. They are putting the powder and the arms in the forehold. Now you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then you are bringing four of your own people with you, and they tell me some of them are to be birthed forward. Why not give them the berths here beside the cabin? Second point. Any more? asked Mr. Trelawney. One more said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I've heard myself, continued Captain Smollett, that you have a map of an island, that there's crosses on the map to show where treasure is, and that the island lies. And then he named the, lat the latitude and longitude exactly. I never told that, cried the squire, to a soul! The hands know it, sir, returned the captain. Lives in, that must have been you or Hawkins, cried the, cried the squire. It doesn't much matter who it was, replied the doctor, and I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure, he was so loose a talker. Yet in this case I believe he was really right, that nobody had told the situation of the island. Well, gentlemen, continued the captain, I don't know who has this map, but I make it a point it shall be kept secret even from me and Mr. Arrow. Otherwise, I would ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship, manned with my friend's own people and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett. With no intention to take offense, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No captain, sir, would be justified in going to sea at all if he had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same, all may be for what I know, but I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man jack aboard of her. I see things going, as I think, not quite right and I ask you to take certain precautions, or let me resign my berth. And that's all. Captain Smollett, began the doctor with a smile, did you hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say, but you remind me of that fable. When you came in here, I'll stake my wig. You meant more than this? Doctor, said the captain, you are smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more, I would, cried the squire. Had Livesey had not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I have heard you. I will do as you desire, but I think the worse of you. That's as you please, sir, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty. And with that, he took his leave. Trelawney said the doctor. Contrary to all my notions, I believe you have managed to get two honest men on board with you. That man and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire. But as for that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and right downright un-English. Well, says the doctor, we shall see. When we came on deck, the men had all begun already to take out the arms in powder, yo-hoing at their work, while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled, six berths had been made astern, out of what had been the after part of the main hold, and this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and forecastle by a sparred passage on the port side. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the doctor, and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now Redrith and I were to get two of them, and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion, which had been enlarged on each side till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low it was, very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks, and even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew. But that is only a guess, for as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. We were all hard at work, changing the powder and the berths when the last man or two, and Long John along with them, came off in a shore boat. 
The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness, and as soon as he saw what he was doing, So ho, mates, says he, what's this? We're a-changing the powder, Jack, answers one. Why, by the powers, cried Long John, if we do, we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain shortly. You may go below, my man. Hands will want supper. Aye, aye, sir, answered the cook, and touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of the galley. That's a good man, Captain, said the doctor. Very likely, sir, replied Captain Smollett. Easy with that, men, easy, he ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder, and then, suddenly observing me examining the swivel we carried amid ships, a long brass nine. Here, you ship's boy, he cried, out of that, off with you to the cook and get some work. And then I was hurrying off, I, as I was hurrying off, I heard him say quite loudly to the doctor, I'll have no favorites on my ship. I assure you, I was quite of the squire's way of thinking, and hated the captain deeply. Chapter 10 The Voyage All night we were in a great bustle, getting things stowed in their place, and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and a safe return. We never had a night, we never had a night at the Admiral Binbow when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when a little before dawn the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the dock. All of the deck, excuse me, all was so new and interesting to me. The brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. Now, barbecue, tip us a stave, cried one voice. The old one, cried another. Aye, aye, mates, said Long John, who was standing by, with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air in words I knew so well. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. And then the whole crew bore chorus. Yo, ho, ho, on a bottle of rum. And at the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in that chorus. But soon the anchor was short up, soon it was hanging, dripping at the bows, soon the rail began to draw on the land and the sh and shipping to flit by on either side, and before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I am not going to relate that voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship, the crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which required to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it. For after a day or two at sea, he began to appear on deck with hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time, he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself. Sometimes he lay all day in his little bunk at one side of the cabin. Sometimes, for a day or two, he would be almost sober and attend to his work at least passably. In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased, we could do nothing to solve it. And when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh if he were drunk, and if he were sober, deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer and a bad influence among the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright, so nobody was much surprised nor very sorry when one dark night with a head sea he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves the trouble of putting him in irons. But there we were without a mate, and it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Joe Anderson, was the likeliest man aboard, and though he kept his old title, he served in a way as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for he often took a watch in easy weather. And the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, 
Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship, he carried his old crutch by a lanyard round his neck to have both hands as free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against a bulkhead and propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship, get on with his cooking like someone safe ashore. Still more strange was it to see him, in the heaviest of weather, cross the deck. Excuse me. He had a line or two rigged up to help him across the widest spaces, Long John's earrings, they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard, as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. <sighs> He's no common man, Barbecue, said the coxswain to me. He had good schooling in his young days, and he can speak like a book when so minded, and brave, a lion's nothing alongside of Long John. I see him grapple four and knock their heads together, him unarmed. All the crew respected and even obeyed him. He had a way of talking to each and doing everybody some particular service. To me, he was unweariedly kind, and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin, the dishes hanging up burnished and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Come away, Hawkins. Come and have a yarn with John. "'Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son. "'Sit you down and hear the news. "'Here's Captain Flint. "'I calls my parrot Captain Flint after the famous buccaneer. "'Here's Captain Flint predicting success to our voyage. "'Was it ya, Captain?' "'And the parrot would say with great rapidity, "'Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! "'till you wondered that it was not out of breath, "'or till John threw his handkerchief over the cage. "'Now that bird,' he would say, "'is maybe two hundred years old, Hawkins. "'They lives forever, mostly, "'and if anybody's seen more wickedness, "'it must be the devil himself. "'She's sailed with England, "'the great cotton England, the pirate. "'She's been at Madagascar, at Malabar, "'at Suriname, and Providence, and Portobello. "'She was at the fishing up of the wrecked plat ships.' It's there she learned pieces of eight, and little wonder, 350,000 of them, Hawkins. She was at the Barden of the Viceroy of the Indies, out of Goa, she was. And to look at her, you would think she was a baby. But you smelt powder, didn't you, Captain? What? Stand by to go about, the parrot would scream. Ha <laughs> she's a handsome craft, she is, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket, and then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for wickedness. There, John would say, you can't touch pitch and not be mucked, lad. Here's this poor old innocent bird of mine swearin' blue fire, and none the wiser you may lay to that. She would swear the same in a matter of speaking before chaplain. And John would touch his forelock with, some, with a solemn way he had that made me think he was the best of men. In the meantime, the squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another. The squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short and dry and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. "'She'll lie a port nearer the wind than a man has a right to expect of his own married wife, sir. "'But,' he would add, "'all I say is we're not home again, and I don't like the cruise.'" The squire at this would turn away and march up and down the deck, the chin in the air. A trifle more of that man, he would say, and I shall explode. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise, for it is my belief there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse, there was duff on odd days, as, for instance, if the squire had it, any man's, had it was any man's birthday, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good come never knew good come of it yet, the captain said to doctor Livesey. Spoil fossil hand makes devils, that's my belief. But good did come of the apple barrel, as you shall hear, for if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning, and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about.
We had run up the trades to get the wind of the island we were after. I am not allowed to be more plain. And now we were running down for it with a bright lookout day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage by the largest computation. Some time that night, or at latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight Treasure Island. We were heading south-southwest, and at a steady breeze abeam and quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing alow and aloft. Everyone was in the bravest spirits, because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over, and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward, looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail and whistling away gently to himself, and that was the only sound excepting the swish of the sea against the bows and the s- blah, <clears throat> excuse me, and around the sides of the ship. In I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left. But, sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and, before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there, trembling, and listening in the extreme fear and curiosity for from these dozen words I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. Chapter 11 What I Heard in the Apple Barrel No, not I, said Silver. Flint was cotton. I was quartermaster along of my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg. Old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon, him, that amputated me, out of college and all. Latin by the bucket and what not. But he was hanged like a dog and sun-dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men, that was, and comed of changing names to their ships, royal fortune, and so on. Now, what a ship was christened, so let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old Warris, Flint's old ship, as I've seen a muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. "'Ah!' cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. "'He was the flower of the flock, was Flint.' "'Davis was a man, too, by all accounts,' said Silver. "'He never sailed along of him, first with England, then with Flint. "'That's my story. "'And now, here on my account, in a manner of speaking, "'I laid by nine hundred safe from England, and two thousand after Flint. Oh, "'It ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in bank.' "'Tain't earnin' now. It's savin', does it, you may lay to that. "'Where's all England's men now?' "'I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most of em aboard here, and glad to get the duff. "'Wind's beggin' before that, some on em. "'Old Pew has, <coughs> excuse me, as had lost his sight, and might have thought shame, "'spends twelve hundred pound in a year like a lord in Parliament. "'Where is he now?' Well, he's dead, and under hatches. But for two year before that, shiver my timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use, after all, said the young seaman. Tain't much use for fools, you may lay to it. That nor nothing, cried Silver. But now you look here. You're young, you are, and you're as smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used on myself. I think if I had been able that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on, like little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough, and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks. And when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now the most goes for rum and a good fling, and to sea again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. 
I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywheres by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark ya. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough, too, says you. Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself a nothing heart desires, and slept soft and ate dainty all my days but when at sea. And how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You don't show your face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? asked Silver derisively. At Bristol, in banks and places, answered his companion. It were, said the cook, it were when we weighed anchor. But my old missus has it all by now. And the spy glasses sold, lease and goodwill and riggin, and the old girl's off to meet me. I would tell you where, for I trust ye. But it'd make ye jealous among the mates. And can you trust your missus? asked the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook, usually trusts little among themselves, and right they are, you may lay to it. But I have a way with me I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, it won't be the same world with old John. There was some that feared of Pew, and some that was feared of Flint, but Flint his own self was feared of me. Feared he was and proud. He was the roughest crew afloat with flints. The devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with him. Well, now, I tell you, I'm not a boosting man. And you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, lambs wasn't the word for flints, old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself in old John's ship. Well, I tell you now replied the lad. I didn't half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you, John, but there's uh, my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrels shook. And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clapped my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune, they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate, and the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for, Silver giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. Dick Square, said Silver, "'Oh, I know Dick was square,' returned the voice of the coxswain in his real hands. "'He's no fool, Dick.' And he turned his quid and spat. "'But look here,' he went on. "'Here's what I want to know, Barbecue. "'How long are we a-going to stand off and own like a blessed bumboat? "'I've had a-most enough a Captain Smollett. "'He's haze be long enough by thunder. "'I want to go into that cabin, I do. "'I want their pickles and wines and that.' Hmm. "'Israel,' said Silver. Your head ain't much account, nor ever was. But you're able to hear, I reckon. <clears throat> Leastways, your ears is big enough. Now, here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word. And you may lay to that, my son. Will I? <clears throat> well, I don't say no, now do I? Growled the coxswain. <laughs> what I say is win. That's what I say. When? By the powers, cried Silver. Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here's a first-rate seaman. Captain Smollett sails the blessed ship for us. Here's the squire and the doctor with a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more do you, says you. Well, then. I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck. Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think, said the lad Dick. We're all fossil hands, you mean, snapped Silver. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back to the trades, at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish, em, finish with them at the island as soon as a blunt's on board, and a pity it is. 
but you're never happy till you're drunk, split my sides. I've seen a sick heart. I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. <clears throat> Easy, hold long John, cried Israel. Who's a crossing o' you? Why, how many tall ships think ye now have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads dying in the sun at execution dock, cried Silver. And all for this same hurry, a hurry, and hurry. You hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea I have. If you would only lay your course and point to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you. I know you. You'll have your mouth full of rum tomorrow and go hang. Mm. That is the end of our time for today. So, we will pick back up tomorrow right where we left off. Remember that if you just tuned in towards the end, or you missed any of the earlier streams, you can go to the channel and view them, for they record to the channel within a few minutes' time. And we will see you again tomorrow for the last of our Treasure Island streams. And thank you for tuning in.